You know, sometimes we pull a guy over, he's had a little bit too much to drink, but he says, who, him? Nah, never touch the stuff. So we give him the drunkometer test. Now, we used to do it with a balloon. It's really a bubble you make with your breath, and if a driver's been drinking intoxicated beverages, alcohol will show up in the bubble, and the balloon will change color. That's one good way to use a bubble. But these days, we got better drunkometers. But we still use bubbles in all sorts of ways. And you're going to see it today, all right? Hope I pass the test. <laughs> size or shape I make the wire, even this crazy shape like this, I'm always going to get round bubbles, right? Yeah, even with that one. Wow. Look at those. Jean, right. both you and Fred are mathematicians, right? That's right. And you're both into bubbles. Oh, they go together, Mark. One of the things we study is rules for the shapes that soap bubbles make. Rules and, for bubbles? And one of the rules is no matter what shape you bend the wire, the bubble is going to always turn out round when you blow it. You mean if I take this piece of wire and bend it into a triangle, the bubble's going to come out round? Try it and see. Okay. There. Oh, that's a nice triangle. <laughs> okay. And the bubble's going to come out round, right? Try it and see. Oh, there wow. Go. <laughs> and doggone. No sharp edges around here. bubbles when you wash clothes or dishes. You can make them by blowing through a straw, too. But I guess really they're kind of useless. Not really. Why? Bubbles actually are used in lots of things. Really? Like what? Well, how about ice cream? Ice cream? Yeah, bubbles of air and ice cream make it soft and smooth. Without them, it would be hard as ice. And what soda without bubbles in it? That's right. Yeast makes gas bubbles in bread dough, so the bread rises and it's fluffy, not tough. Shaving foam is full of millions and millions of tiny bubbles. That's what makes it creamy, I guess. Some kinds of insulation used for keeping homes warm in winter are made by blowing bubbles into plastic. Do animals ever use bubbles? Yes, some insects do. The praying mantis makes an egg case out of bubble-filled foam. And there's a kind of spider that takes a bubble of air with it when it goes underwater for breathing. Very clever. Yes, indeed. And a lot of bubbles can put out a fire. That's a really big fire. Now watch. They're going to try and put it out with a fire-preventing foam. Yeah, that works. That really put it out fast. And basically, the foam that we're using on the fire such as we have here today is a bubble substance, very similar to soap that you have in your bathtub or in your dishwashing liquid. What the foam is actually is a thousands and thousands of tiny little bubbles. As you can see here, these, these thousands of bubbles are very effective in putting out the fires. In order to have a fire, you need to have fuel and air and heat. And uh, what the, the foam does is it slides out over the surface of the fire and cuts off the fuel from the air. It, it forms a layer between the fuel and the air so that it suffocates it. Boy, that's quick. That's neat. I guess bubbles aren't useless after all. Not hardly. From here on, I will respect bubbles. Okay, so I got respect for bubbles. But what I still want to know is how come a bubble has to be round? Yeah. 
Well, partly because of the way bubbles form, Mark. Think about how you inflate something like a tire or a balloon. For example, here is a balloon in the shape of a sausage. If I blow it up and put air on the inside, it's not going to turn out to be the shape of a round balloon, but it's going to turn out to be the shape of a sausage. So it's going to start out round, watch. There, it's more or less round. When I put the rest of the air in it, it turns out to be more or less like a sausage. <laughs> you know, we have a friend named Lisa who took a ride in a balloon, a hot air balloon. You have to get up really early in the morning when the air is cool to fly a balloon. In the mountains of Colorado, I went on a flight with Joyce Vanderhoff, who's an expert balloonist. This just needs to be, just to be here to hold the burner up in place. This is our burner. Now, what does this burner do? What does it burn? <coughs> Burns propane. Yeah. And uh, that's what creates the heat inside the balloon. Propane is the type of gas. Yeah. Right. Be about 2,000 degrees coming out of the burner. 2,000? Mm -hmm. What we're doing is capturing the hot air, the warmer air, inside this big fabric balloon. And, uh, and by capturing that air and heating it about 120 degrees warmer than the outside air, that's what causes the lift and that's what makes us able to fly. We're going to use this to fill the balloon with cold air. Turn the burner on now. Joyce, how big is the balloon? It's seven stories high and 55 feet in diameter. I want to make sure there's no one above me because if I launch and someone's sitting above me, we're going to have a little mid air collision, which we don't want to do. It's okay if balloons come in alongside of me, but we can't be have one right above me. Wait off the balloon. Everybody let go. Okay, we're flying. All right. This is great. Parachute in the top of the balloon. People put weight on the basket. Come on over and hang on to the basket. Where's that you letting cool air? I'm letting the hot air out. Pretty soon the balloon will be entirely collapsed. Put your arms around it and squeeze the air out. Okay. Mm. Yeah, you can feel it. Okay, uh -huh. just go all the way along there. <laughs> Good. Oh Clear to the end. How long is this, Joyce? It's got to go 70 feet all the way to the end. Here we go. Here it is. Push it down. Push. All 
the way. <laughs> Hold on. Guys, you have easy job. Okay. Just about there. Like we're getting small. We did it. No, I understand what a balloon is, but what's a bubble made of? Water, soapy water. Yeah, but what holds the water together? I mean, how can it stay in one place like that without dripping apart? Uh, surface tension, mainly. Wait, surfaces get tense? Well, they sure do. The, the surface of water is very much like a tight trampoline. If you're on a pond, for example, you and I are so heavy that if we step on a pond, we'll just go sink right through and get wet. Yeah. But if you're light enough, like a little water bug, you can just scoot around all over the surface of the pond, bouncing along and never once get wet. Is that why when you just barely touch water, it kind of grabs onto your finger? Yes, that's also a surface tension phenomenon. Let me show you another one. If I take this wire mesh here, ordinary piece of wire mesh, see it has lots of holes in it, water runs right through it. Mm -hmm. right. But if I put it over the glass like this, turn it upside down. Water's going to go like that, see? Right. Stop. Oh, wow. Yeah. How come the water doesn't just pour right out? Well, that's surface tension again. Remember how the surface of water is like a thin trampoline? Yeah. Well, by itself, it's not quite strong enough to hold up all this water. But you put the wire mesh under it, and it provides just enough support that it can hold it up. Oh, wow. The water takes hold of each little hole in the mesh and just seals it right off. The surface tension also molds the uh, drops of water into drops, like that. And when the what drop hits the water, surface tension molds its splash into an amazing shape. the inside pushing out, surrounded by soapy water on the outside, pushing in to the smallest possible area. And that smallest possible area has to be round. A single water drop, or inflated to a perfect bubble. It stays round as long as surface tension pulling inward matches air pressure pushing outward. Or until somebody pokes it and the bubble bursts. It's got going here, some kind of bubble factory? Well, we're sure trying. We seem to have a lot of breakage. Well, I'll tell you something. You try to be a lot more careful when the bubble you're blowing is glass. Joe, it's not as easy as it looks. I was killing myself, and that's all I got. Well, you're doing fine. It's just that the glass started to cool off and become hard. Hard? It was falling off before. Well, now you can see that it's quite hard. In fact, <laughs> if I hit it hard enough, it breaks. That's one of the properties of glass. When it gets cold, it's very hard. But when it's hot, not only does it look like honey, oh, wow. but it drips. That's really just neat. Just like pouring honey. Yeah, it does look like honey. Now you can see this glass, when I hit it with a hammer, nothing happens, because this glass is about 2,000 degrees. And then when it gets cool, it becomes hard. That's right. This glass over here has already become very hard and easily broken. So if I were to take some glass in my house and, and chop it up like that, would I be able to put it in the oven? Well, your oven only goes to 500 degrees so that the glass wouldn't melt. What is glass made of, anyhow? I mean, like, I use it every day, but I've never really thought of what, what goes into it. 
Well, the principal ingredient of glass is powdered sand, which is used commercially for making glass. Here's some beach sand. This was used over 4,000 years ago by the Syrians and the Egyptians. But we buy broken glass from a factory that produces glass from these chemicals. And their rejects, we throw into the furnace and melt down. So you get all their mistakes? That's right. We take this glass and just throw it into the furnace, and it remelts. First thing we have to do is make sure that the furnace is up to temperature, 2,200 degrees. Okay, I have a stainless steel tube. It's quite cool at this end, but the end has been heated up red hot. Yeah. I'm reaching into the furnace, which is full of molten glass. That means it's all um, melted? Right, the glass is in a liquid state. And you can see how the glass is flowing very slowly back and forth. Okay, now I'm going to roll this on the table. This is, this is the marvering table. Why are you rolling it? I'm rolling it to make the outside of the gather symmetrical. Now I'm going to blow through the tube to make a bubble at the end of the pipe. When you blow a bubble, how come it always comes out round? Because there's an equal pressure exerted on all sides of the interior of the bubble. So that forms a sphere in you your mean, body. You couldn't get a square bubble? What if you had a square straw? No, it would still make a round bubble. Now, this bubble has cooled down considerably, so I have to go back to the furnace and reheat it. Now, what do you have to do after this? All we have to do is make a, uh, a mark on the glass to break this bubble away from the steel pipe. You ready? Uh-huh. OK, now you can see that. It's fairly hot now, and if we stop turning it, Whoa. the glass starts to fall down and droop. See What's how it, pulling it down like that? The force of gravity is, is pulling against the glass. So if you keep it rolling evenly, the glass will stay symmetrical. Okay, now you just have to squeeze a groove between the bubble and the, and the pipe. You know, the heat is really <laughs> coming up from this glass. Well, it, it's only about 1,800 degrees now. Is that all? <laughs> no, it, it's cooled off considerably. Now, I'm just using a solid rod this time. And again, I'm reaching into the furnace, gathering some glass on the end of it. I have to go to the marbling table. Now, this is going to be the, the stem on the bottom of the goblet. OK. Keep rolling? Keep rolling. Okay. Okay, now stop rolling for a second. Okay, now roll it again. Now this just sticks on to each other? That's right, the glass sticks because it's so hot. Even though this doesn't appear hot anymore, it's still about 1,200 degrees. I can just squeeze this glass with the shears and cut it right off. It's almost like clay the way it cuts. Just... Okay. Checking the stem now to make sure that it's on center. I'm squeezing the jacks to make little marks. Now this is going to be the decoration for the stem. So you can you can decorate it while it's still hot, huh? That's right. Now the next thing I'll do is gather some glass on the bottom of the stem. I'll flatten that glass out and squeeze it so it makes a foot, so the goblet has something to stand on. That just evens it out? Right. I'll finish squeezing it between the two pieces of wood. You really make it look so easy. I can't believe it. It is easy. I'm sure after about 12 lessons, you can make something that looks like this. Maybe not exactly like this. <laughs> now, I'm just taking a small gather of glass Now, I attach this rod to the bottom of the goblet, mm -hmm. let it roll, make sure it's on the center. Now, I just scratch the neck. And tap it. You see that it breaks off from the pipe and leaves a very jagged mark. I just have to heat up the top part of the bubble, and then you can help me open that bubble up so that we can drink out of it. Now you use those stainless steel tools again. 
called the jacks. And just put the fingers inside the hole and push up against the top edge of the bubble to open it up. Spread out? Just a little bit. That's it, right there. That's good. Very good. That's really neat. Okay, there we go. Is this it? I mean, is That's it a glass it. now? Yeah, here we are. Finished goblet. Wow. Okay, you want to pull that up there? It's so beautiful. I can't believe we made it just like that all of a sudden. It's really nice. I can't believe it. Oh. Oh. <laughs> I can't believe I did that. It was so pretty after all that work. I'm sorry. Yeah, well, so am I. <laughs> well, well, at least we could just pick it up and put it back in the fire and start all over again. Yeah, that's one thing we've learned today. Right? You can always melt the glass back down. Glass is very easily recyclable. That's good. I've got to admit that that glass blowing was really beautiful. It's too bad I was such a klutz. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> no, really. Did you know that you could also do the same thing with soap bubbles? Really? Yeah. Watch this. Ta-da! Wow. <laughs> Isn't that pretty? Great. Yep. They're really beautiful. And not only that, they may give us some clues about some very ancient forms of life. They're called radiolarians, and they began living in the sea millions of years ago. The forms they took may have been a result of surface tension acting on them just the way it does on the bubble frames. They existed as bubbles. So whatever happened to these bubble creatures anyway? Well, they're still living in the oceans, but sadly enough, they're dying out. Yeah? Well, but knowing about bubbles tells you how they developed in the first place, right? Well, it doesn't tell you everything, but it does provide you some clues. Clues? I feel a mystery coming on. <laughs> Whenever there's trouble, we'll the double with a blood-hound gang. If you've got the crime, we've got the time with a blood-hound gang. Did you hear the new release by the sewer rats? Yeah, I heard them. Ugh. They shouldn't be released. They should be trapped. <laughs> we interrupt this program for a special bulletin. The 3,000-year-old mummy of an Egyptian queen has been stolen from the county museum. A ransom note has been received demanding half a million dollars for the return of the royal mummy. Details on the hour. <laughs> This must be the stolen mummy we just heard about on the radio. This is the Egyptian queen? Half a million bucks for that? Hey, what are you pugs doing? All right. All right. <sighs> All right. Throw him in the creep van. I mean, throw him in the van. Creep. Come on, we can't risk it. Hey, wait a minute. All right, kid, be smart. Shut up. Go on. Give me that. Close that door. Listen, listen. It's too chancy to leave that mummy parked here. We get a couple more tickets on it, and she'll be towed away. I'll tell you what. I'll stow this at the airport, and you pick me up. What do we do with the kids? Oh. Yeah, they know what we look like, so... Uh, bad news for them, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Us. I wish we could see out. Listen, we must be going through River Tunnel. Maybe we can figure out direction. I'm gonna make notes. Sure, a lot of junk back here. That little hole. Ricky, lift me up. Maybe I can see out. Hold me steady. I am. I can hardly see anything. We're jiggling too much. Feels like a little spot busted through. Why'd you let me go? I have a better idea. If I can find a hunk of cardboard in all this junk. Hear that? We must be near the airport. What are you doing? I'm making a pinhole camera. A what? Look. It's upside down. No kidding. 
The pinhole acts as a lens. The rays of light crisscross. It's as if we were inside a big camera box. Well, it looks like the airport, all right. Terrific! The parking lot. I bet they figure on leaving the car here until they collect the ransom. And then they'll call the museum and let them know where to pick up the mummy. Well, let's get out of here. What about the kids? <laughs> Leave them in the back. We'll take care of them later, huh? Can the Bloodhound Gang escape? Tune in tomorrow for the exciting conclusion of The Case of the Thing in the Trunk. been looking at a very special kind of surface, the walls of bubbles, millions of little tiny ones that are useful, and one very huge bubble that's fun. So, now we've all learned to respect bubbles, right? Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> I respect bubbles, but the air pressure pushing outward balanced by the surface tension pulling inward that makes them round, so help me. <laughs> <laughs> but, will we always respect bubbles? As long as they last. Yeah. Three Two One Contact is a production of the Children's Television Workshop.